don't let the intimidation of other people's negative stories impede on your progress you know like like you just move forward okay so here's the truth about science 99 percent of the time you're gonna lose okay you're gonna lose but it's that one percent of time where where you get a win and you have the ability to change the world Welcome to our podcast, So She Can Speak. Today, we're so happy and excited to have our first guest on our podcast, Dr. Tracy Fanara. Hi, everybody. It's so, thank you so much for having me here. I, I'm honored. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you can tell the audience a bit more about yourself and your story about how you got into the STEM field. Yeah. So, wow, it's a pretty long story, but I think it all kind of started back to when I was little and, and there's, there's a few different, you know, when you think back on your life, there are like these moments that like kind of led you on the path that you're on now. And I think that the first one was, was the fact that I had like these Coke bottle glasses at five years old and everybody just had these expectations of me that I would be smart. And I kind of like wanted to live up to that. So I worked really hard. And I think that that's important because we have to have expectations expectations, high expectations, and we have to believe in other people to help them succeed. I think that that's something that was really, really important. Um, and then I started winning uh, science fairs. I was, I loved inventing, like I wanted to create things that didn't exist. So, and I loved animals. So all my inventions had to do with animals, like automatic dog feeder, or, you know, automatic dog letter router, or like, I, I was five, so my the names weren't that clever, um, but things like that. But you know, like really, the two the two pinnacle moments throughout my life that really set me on my path were when I was in fourth grade. I learned about a hazardous waste dump site where industries were dumping toxins into a canal way, and those toxins were leaching into the soil and groundwater and moving. And then people were building houses and schools and there were cancer clusters and birth defects. And that's when I realized, and that was right down the street from where I was growing up. And even though I wasn't impacted, my friend's parents were, my mom had cancer in her twenties, you know? Um, so, so I realized very quickly that everything in the world is connected. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect our health, just like the water cycle, you know? And then, and then when I was, uh, even in college, when I learned that unsafe drinking water was the world's leading killer among children, that's when I really realized what passion was. I wanted to do something, whether it was paid for it or not, I just wanted to do something. And, and that's kind of what led me on the path to, you know, drinking water, purification, researching our oceans, things like that. Who or what inspired you to be in the field you are in now? Yeah. I went to a school, and, and I know you guys are, are going to be looking at colleges, and it's really tough in picking a college, but the thing is, like, don't get too stressed out about it, because you can always transfer, and that's exactly what I did. I wanted to go to a small school, and my parents would only let me go, like, an hour and a half away from home, and uh, it, was, it was beautiful school. You know, it was great. You have instant friends the minute you're there at a small school, and you know everybody, but that's kind of the problem after the second year, right? You know everybody. And, and my parents had moved to Florida. They wouldn't let me go more than an hour and a half from Buffalo. And then they moved to Florida. But uh, so I applied to the University of Florida. And I was a camp counselor in Maine at the time when my parents got the letter that said that I was rejected. And I was like... Oh, you know, sometimes getting rejected makes you realize what you want. So I took my transcripts down to the University of Florida and I knocked on every door until someone was there. And it happened to be the director of environmental engineering. I had never even known that the field existed. And when he was telling me that environmental engineers are the real like superheroes of the planet, they provide clean water and food and protect people from natural disasters and get to design and build things. I was like, sign me up. I, I want to be that. And everything kind of came full circle. Everything that I learned about 
in fourth grade and, and everything that I learned about throughout school and throughout life kind of came full circle when I found environmental engineering. And he let me into the University of Florida right then and there. Uh, and that's how I became an engineer. I, before that, I really thought engineering was, was going to be boring. I thought it was going to be all math, but no meaning. I didn't really understand what engineering was and how, how important it was in how our world works today and how engineering is literally all around us everywhere, just like science. What are some challenges you have come across and how did you overcome them? And uh, yeah, so I became an environmental engineer. I went and I worked in the field designing cities all over the world. And it was, it was great. But one thing I realized is that we were always building to minimum regulations, no matter what. So we were approaching every single problem the same way. And I'm like, there, there's something wrong with this. And so when I tried to get creative and implement sustainable design, so ways to be less impactful on our water quality and the environment, it, it was definitely shot down. Even though I told them I could save them time and money, they didn't care. They knew what worked and how long it took and how much it was gonna cost. And so I went back to school to prove that there was a better way. So I got my master's in pollutant transport. Basically, algae blooms are an increasing problem. So is erosion and water quality. And so what I looked at for my master's was developing a filter media to remove pollutants from stormwater runoff. And then for my PhD, I created it myself based on my experience in project engineering. So I, it's called the hydrologic restoration. It's sustainable design, basically mimicking the natural water cycle, even though things are built on it. So we're making everything from the ground underneath hydrologically or water-wise look exactly as it did before something was built on it. And we can do that through engineering design and it eliminates the need for pipes, storm pipes, um, and all of that infrastructure and allows for water to be naturally treated through the soils, it allows, you know, just a, pollutants to be kept on the site that they originated on. Uh, that's a big thing because a lot of these pollutants, they get transported downstream into our natural water bodies. They're causing, you know, uh, algae blooms and uh, different abnormalities in reproductive cycles and births of, of our ecosystem that we depend on to survive. So, and those are things that people can do at their house every day. So I proved that, that there was a better way to do it and I still couldn't get regulations to change. So I looked back throughout history and I realized that, you know, there, there were times when huge changes happened in regulation and they were always tied to public outcry. You know, like Love Canal, when I talked about that incident in Buffalo, New York, that started the EPA Superfund program. And like citizens working hard for a decade to clean up the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn finally got it done. You know, things like that, like Taylor oil spill, it was citizen scientists that were working on the BP oil spill that noticed a 15 year long oil spill was still going on that no one knew about. You know, like things like that, it, it comes down to the public being educated. And so when I was applying for jobs after my PhD, I was looking for something that would allow me to communicate science as well as do research. What are some of your biggest accomplishments? And I was selected as a presidential management fellow and you work for the federal government and it's like a fast track up. But I, I didn't take it. I took the job that paid me the least because it allowed me to both communicate and do research. Really, it just means that you have two full-time jobs. I did not stop working for six years straight. Uh, I was the program manager at Memorial Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. And I did a number of projects, everything from designing water treatment media and building apps and websites to alert the public of toxic algae blooms and other water conditions to designing an aquaponic system for space travel that uses wastewater in the process with bivalves to clean for drinking water. 
Um, so I've, I've done so many things, but uh, I did a lot of presentations, like hard big public health threat. The toxin not only was causing mass fish kills, this is called Florida red tide, by the way. It's a species called Corinia brevis. It's in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but we were getting mass fish kills every single year. But in addition, that toxin can aerosolize. What that means is that it, it attaches onto salt particles in the air and moves on shore. So people were breathing in the toxin. And so that's why this is, you know, such a big deal. And that's why I had to do so many presentations. The director of one of the offices at NOAA saw me speak and said, hey, you know, like, we, we're going to have a, a job opening up. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. And a year and a half later, I got an email randomly. It's like, just so you know, that job's finally open. I'm like, totally forgot about that job. But I applied for it. And it was a position to manage United States coastal ocean modeling for NOAA. It's a big position. I was like, okay, that's not what, it's not really what you said. There's no way I'm going to get this position at, you know, my age, but, but I did. I don't, I, I don't know how, and I just started in August and it's so exciting that now I'm looking at the world from a, you know, a big picture like how all of these earth systems fit together to impact us. And it allows me that, that experience at Mount Marine Laboratories on human health, recreation, tourism, like how connected we are to the oceans, which is helping me now in my position today. What advice do you have for people about pursuing their education and dream careers? Basically, the point is that no matter what direction you take, it's a journey. And you can totally make like, sharp turns in it. You know, I, I was a freshwater stormwater expert. You know, I, I was storm chasing and I end up doing marine biology. You know what I mean? So just allow yourself versatility. And, and if you are going into grad school, keep it as broad as possible so you have as many options as possible. That's my advice. People will tell you otherwise, but it worked for me. Your story, like hearing your story is so incredibly inspiring and so cool because you have done and accomplished so many things and worked so hard and I'm sure there's still so much that you will continue to accomplish like very like awe-inspired and like kind of starstruck right now um, oh, <laughs> yeah because I think <laughs> Salina and I as people who as women who both want to pursue like careers in STEM just seeing um, you out there like doing all this and continually working hard to get all these amazing things done is so inspiring to me and I'm sure it's inspiring to many others out there. Um, well, I think it's awesome that you guys are doing this because not only you're, you're doing communication, communication is so important because that's how we learn about a lot of these disciplines. Like I never knew about environmental engineering. That was just luck, you know, and then on top of it, you know, women in STEM, that's a, that's a huge thing, but that is shifting. But for now, it's really good that we are, that we're unique, you know, like it's scientifically proven that diverse teams are more effective and more efficient than those that aren't diverse. And, it, and it's so important to bring that diversity into teams, like not only diversity in, you know, gender or background color, but also diversity of skill set and geographic location. Because what I'm noticing, the more and more scientists that I meet, where they came from and their experiences, their story that, that you just asked me about, dictates so much of what they focus on on a group project. And so, so for example, if I'm if I'm doing a project trying to figure out why and how fish populations are being decimated and why our ecosystem balance in the ocean is basically crumbling, not to be negative. But, but if I'm doing that, I want someone from Alaska that understands where most of that, those commercial fishing boats are, you know, I want her perspective. And I also want someone from Nantucket and I want someone from the Gulf of Mexico, you know, in California. Like I want someone from all those places because I don't know, you, it's impossible for any one of us to know everything. And that diversity brings such a more powerful team. 
Mm -hmm. And I think your understanding of that is so incredibly insightful. I feel like teens nowadays can kind of see how um, adults, even though they are adults, sometimes might have a more closed minded views. And so seeing you know and understand the importance of like having a diverse team and having people from different backgrounds and perspectives it, um, and understanding how to make that successful in your own projects is very cool. Um, and kind of leading back to what you said, uh, as a question I have is, do you think any of like the challenges or barriers you faced were due to you being a woman or how did you see being a woman in STEM? Like um, what were the barriers that you had to overcome for that? That's a great question. And you know, depending on who you ask, you'll get a different question. So my experience is not universal at all. I had friends that, that really had problems, like no matter what idea she, she threw out, someone would either take it and call it their own or just ignore her, you know, and she was, she's the most brilliant engineer that I know. Um, and it, for me, okay, my first job in project engineering, I was the only female and I was like not invited to baseball games. Like it was super weird, like that kind of stuff. But I, I thought it was funny, this good old boys club. Um, but still like, that's not good. That's not okay actually. Um, and I didn't realize that at 22, you know, like I thought it was, I thought they were being idiots, but, but it didn't anger me. Like it would now, if one of my interns had that same experience, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, but besides that, being a female has actually benefited me because I have a unique perspective. You just cannot be afraid to speak up and it's so hard to know where that line is because for me, that's how I learn. I say things that are incorrect and I allow people to correct me and I change my, you know, my next time I say something, I change it, but that's just my personality, you know? So for me, I had really had to dial back and be, not speak too much, you know, be careful about what, what I spoke on depending on who I was around and if I trusted them in that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, it, but that's, that's the case no matter what, you know, but, but you just cannot be afraid to speak up and being a female and being diverse will absolutely benefit you if you use it the right way. And if you go to the right places that actually, you know, praise that at Mount Marine Laboratory, it was founded by a female. We're probably 70% female scientists, but it's also marine biology. And if you look at the gender fraction with marine biology, they are mostly women, you know? Um, but, but there are so many companies that really pride themselves on, I mean, even in the federal government, you know, at NOAA, there's many times that I'm the only female in the meeting room, but, but there's, you know, I, it's not like I feel like I'm alone at all. You know, there are plenty of female engineers and scientists that are there and, you know, getting promoted and all that stuff. So don't, don't let the intimidation of other people's negative stories impede on your progress. You know, like, like you just move forward. You know, if, if people are being like my friend's experience, just, you just move past them. And if there's no way around it, you go to a different, a different company, a different, you know, because it's just not worth you wasting your time because you can't change people's minds, you know? Mm -hmm. This will all make sense someday, I swear. <laughs> no, it's really cool and insightful. And I think, um, like, just my dad always is like, hindsight is twenty twenty. Everyone says hindsight is twenty twenty, and, like, looking yeah. back and understanding, um, like, what happened. I think that's definitely something a lot more people should do, like, to, to really just reflect. So what about you guys? What about you guys in STEM? Yeah, so for me, I feel it's also pretty similar. Um, at a young age, it was kind of encouraged upon me. I was always, like, the bookworm in my family, and so that kind of pressure to be like the smartest one or to be kind of like the nerd in my family was put upon me. Um, but it benefited me because I wanted to be, I wanted to live up to those expectations. And um, now it is a little daunting because I'm still in high school and um, 
applying to, I'm going to be applying to colleges next year. So that's going to be like looking at the major I want to be in, which college is best for me. Um, but ultimately, I think my family had a big part to do in what I wanted to be in. And like that has really grown as like a passion of mine. And um, like going into like pre-medicine or biology, that those are my career field interests. And I think that really stemmed from the background and environment I came from. That's awesome. And what about you, Celine? Um, I think also me as well. My parents expected like a lot of me to be like smart and like study and have good grades. But I think the first time I got into like um, biology was like in sixth grade. Um, the teacher started talking about like vaccines. This was like pre-COVID obviously, but um, I got really interested in like how the lungs work and all of that. So I started like really studying by myself. I still do have like a lot of years of high school. So um, I hope to like learn more in these next few years. It goes fast. It goes super fast. Just got to get through it. And then once you have your degree, that's when you start, you know, hitting the ground running. Yeah. Now, if you guys want any advice on, on picking a college, I can help with that too. But it sounds like your parents are very much involved. They know what they're doing. <laughs> too, so. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, do you have any like closing advice for women who's currently interested in pursuing STEM and the youth um, today who are interested in like pursuing these STEM fields? Yeah, um, when you're going into these STEM fields, okay, so here's the truth about science. 99% of the time, you're gonna lose, okay? You're gonna lose. But it's that 1% of time where, where you get a win and you have, the ability to change the world. So basically, this is this is how I, I tell people. It's kind of like you can pick a career where you win every single day and there's no obstacles. You know exactly what you're going to do and you're going to accomplish. It's kind of like playing Super Mario Brothers when you have the code to beat the game and you just beat it every single day and you come home with a win. Science is the exact opposite. It's like you're at a different level, a different game, a different everything, every single day, everything's new. And you have to work through that. And, and that's, that's the benefit of it. Yeah, you're, you're going to lose 99% of the time, but, but it's, it's the journey and it's the opportunity and to, to do something that no one's ever done before and really advance humanity. Um, and that's what you, you know, what you have in science. So, when you're going through classes and you're taking like differential equations and and organic chem and you know biochem and it's just like completely overwhelming and you're like i you know what my friends my roommate is in marketing and she's going out every night and having fun ignore it because it's not it's it's totally worth it to get through and you're going to hate some of your classes it's just how it is it doesn't mean that you're not meant for it it means that it's challenging you to do things that sometimes you don't want to do to get to where you want to be. And, and that's really important for you to remember as you're going through this because it's, it gets hard. And it's supposed to be. If it wasn't, everybody would do it, you know? Thank you. That was, like, really inspiring. Um, yeah, so I think that concludes this episode of So She Can Speak. So thank you again to Dr. Tracy Quinara for being on here. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And you guys can uh, see me on Discovery's What on Earth and Weather Channel's Weird Earth and Fox's PsyQ. And, oh gosh, I don't know what else I'm on this year, but I, yeah. I'm expert on Weather Channel too. Uh, Definitely make sure to check out Inspector Planet on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, plus so many more other social media platforms. We'll link them all in um, the description. But thank you all for watching this today's episode and a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Tracy Pinar for being here. We really appreciate you telling your story. So it was so inspiring for us to hear and we are just so appreciative of that. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys.